So hello, everybody, and welcome to today's session of Raja and Neil's FASD Book Club, which is based on this book that Raja and Neil edited uh, that includes some of the latest research, not just here in the UK, but from around the world. And we've been doing these lunchtime sessions as a way to make this research more accessible to a wider audience. And today we have Raja himself here. Uh, he can introduce himself. Um, we, but we have Raji here today talking about how uh, the different overlapping presentations um, and FASD can be assessed. So Raja, over to you, please introduce Thank yourself. You. So most of it, I think some of you know me, Raja Mukherjee, I'm a consultant psychiatrist um, down in Surrey um, and honorary professor with uh, Salford. Um, the nice thing about writing a book is that you get to put in chapters that you think people need to learn about. Um, and ever since I started in this area, I'm a broader neurodevelopmental psychiatrist. So that's what I do. I don't just do FASD. I do autism, ADHD. I think about other etiological conditions, behavioral phenotypes, genetic disorders. So my wider work is in all those broader areas. And this chapter was to some degree thinking about that is where does FASD fit into the bigger neurodevelopmental field. And the reason why I thought this was a really important chapter is that when I started, it was the area that caused the most confusion for me, based on what I was doing in learning from other colleagues in the UK and what I was reading in the science in the literature. And it's because the nature of how the world had developed in the North American continent, and I'm going to use Canada and America in the same breath there, because they did things very similarly, was looking at it thing from a quite narrow perspective. Whereas in the UK, from a behavioral phenotype background, it was very different. So a lot of my early PhD, early thinking was around this kind of topic area. And that's what we tried to cover a little bit in this chapter. And the chapter goes into a little bit more detail about some of this. But what I'm going to present is a little bit of um, what that had and then finish with a little bit of the wider overlapping other etiological condition because there's a bit of that in that chapter as well but the main bit I'm going to focus on is the link in terms of neurodevelopmental perspective etiology outcome things like that now those of you who were in Norway and there's a few of you who in the on the couple of you at least who were there will have seen this because my my keynote presentation I gave there was very much around this as being a core part of it there was other bits to it as well so you're going to get a little bit of a taste of what what happened over there in a couple of last week but so the first thing to think think about is is cutoffs because when we talk about neurodiversity and neurodivergent conditions we're all on a spectrum of presentation so I always say I've got visual processing speed issues I see things slower than other people it takes me longer to read the same thing as my kids um, and so I don't play the game double with them because they always win and I always lose and so there's something about knowing yourself within that and the reason why we have these kind of definitions is because they're statistical definitions and in science, what we define as normality and abnormality is by 2.5 standard deviations away from two standard deviations from the norm. And so IQ, for example, is average of 100, 15 points is one standard deviation, two standard deviations is 30 points, therefore 70 is defined as being an abnormality. And a lot of the conditions that we talk about within FASD and the diagnostic criteria use that as a cutoff. Now that doesn't mean that people who have lower levels of that, who have difficulties, don't also have problems. And this is one of the debates that are going on at the moment as to where that should fit, because what we have are people where you have a disorder level where it's obvious and clear. There are people where currently we say, well, you have a difficulty, but it's not quite bad enough for us to define it as a disorder. And those people where it's obvious and clear that it doesn't fit. And so what you have, can you see my pointer or, or not when I move this around? So those people in the red line at the top, it's easy to say, look, in all situations, pervasively, you meet prob you've got difficulties, it's obvious. And the people in the purple line, again, it's easy because they never meet any of the thresholds. But what about those people who kind of vary at times in the temporal relationship where times are functioning okay and times they're not? How do we define that and how do we explain some of those? And should we start to classify them? And then we're starting into what we call this neurodivergent, neurodiverse world. And so we start to see, well, actually, the brain isn't functioning properly, so how do we fit? We also know that actually there are times where you can function and perform quite well, but you introduce a little bit of emotional environmental factors and your dysregulation goes out the window so again somebody who generally functions well 
when we get emotionally distressed, do we say that's an abnormality? Now, I use my mother as an example here, as somebody who generally functions really well, but actually when she gets stressed, she can't do anything. And she's a very capable woman. She was a magistrate, she was a consultant radiologist. You know, she does very well in life, but forget times under stress so do we how do we start to define where these things are because what we want to try and do and what the world wants to do is put people into boxes but people don't fit neatly into boxes so increasingly we're thinking around dimensions of these kind of factors so how does that fit therefore with FASD in the neurodevelopmental world because what we're looking at is to say we have these features we have these factors and we think about things on a dimensional trait and to try and say well actually with regards to social communication or cognitive or whatever, where do we define that cutoff? And that is always the challenge. And part of the debate that goes on is understanding where those cutoffs should be. The second thing to understand is what we understand the difference between what is our causes of problems and what are the outcomes of problems. So here we're talking about the brain. And so when I talk about etiological causes, I'm talking about things that will cause damage to the underlying brain and its pathways, whether that be a genetic disorder or whether that be a teratogenic disorder. And then the outcomes that we see when that brain doesn't function properly. And so if you go back into the history, you can start to see that there are lots of concepts where, where people have an understanding of what something is. And, and our concepts of these things have changed with time. And so if I go back to ICD-10, which was the diagnostic manual we used to use, that is based on research that was done in the 1980s. The more modern ones, which are coming out, so ICD-11, which is due to come out next year, and it started, the, the, well, it's come out now, but it's not being fully used yet. And then DSM-5, these are more based on more modern research. But when we look at figures quoted in the literature, we say, well, actually, why are these figures so variable? So our rates being so much higher than the other ones. And that's something to do with the fact that these are different types of profile. But then we have to think, well, what is the relationship between these kind of things? Is it to do with the fact that we see the most severe cases in our clinic? Or is it to do with actually other people are not recognizing the presentation? If you go back to the very early literature, in FASD, you can see already that things like ASD traits are very commonly described. And again, ADHD traits are very clearly described. And so you can start to say, well, actually, if these are described, why are we not seeing more of it within that? And so one of the first things I did in terms of my PhD, in terms of thinking and working things out, was to try and find a relationship between these two things. And when we talk about a diagnosis such as autism or ADHD, we talk about a top-down approach to those symptoms. Phenomenology is, is what we call descriptive psychopathology. It's about taking a description of a symptom, putting it together in enough times and enough of them together to say you now have a diagnosis because they fit into a clustering. So that's how phenomenology works in terms of top down. So ADHD, you have a cluster of symptoms. If you have enough of those for enough time, you get a diagnosis. Same with autism, same with depression, same with schizophrenia, all the psychiatric diagnoses other than the dementias pretty much fit into that. When we're dealing with something like a genetic disorder or here fatal alcohol syndrome, it's an etiological condition. It's the thing that causes the damage to the brain. And actually then what you look and say, well, what are the potential outcomes you have? And so Down syndrome is a genetic disorder. It is the thing that causes the damage to the brain and the body. And then you have a range of outcomes that we know to look for. And one of the arguments I always say to people who say to me that FASD is not important to diagnose is I say, OK, well, would you refuse? And I would use the word refuse to diagnose um, Down syndrome. If the answer is no, and nearly always it's no, it's not because it's not less important. It's because it's easier to diagnose Downs because it's very visual compared to FASD doesn't decrease the importance. Now, if we take these symptoms and I take a group of frontal lobe symptoms and cluster them on the screen, if I do it one way, you get the core symptoms of ADHD. If I take the same group of symptoms and cluster them another way, you get the core symptoms of autism. Now, in ICD-10, it said we shouldn't get these to overlap. We now know they do. Now, if you see FASD described, every single one of these symptoms is described. So you should hypothesize you should be seeing in some people ASD, some people ADHD as outcomes. So we're thinking about these as causes and outcomes, because what we have is a group of disorders which all lead to these kind of problems, because what they're doing is damaging those pathways. What we know now that genes do is that they're risk markers. They don't lead to definitive outcomes. They lead to a risk of developing damage to a pathway. And 
alcohol is doing the same thing. It is damaging pathways. And if we damage the right type of pathways, you get certain outcomes. And you can compare this to other conditions. And part of my PhD, I compared it to Fragile X because it was a condition that, I, that my colleague was working with. So it was an easy comparison. But it also had an intermediate syndrome of people who had not the full outcome, but some of it. And what you can see is, is if, if you get prenatal alcohol, some people have FASD, some don't, and some people will go on to have ASD, but many other outcomes. In Fragile X, the same situation. About 80 to 90% will have ADHD or ASD, but of some proportion won't. And so it's not an absolute, and it's about thinking about the relationship between these outcomes and the thing that's causing damage to those underlying pathways and the syndromes that we talk about and where they fit. And you can see, even with other syndromes, that there's a range of outcomes. The fragile X, tuberous sclerosis, Chart syndrome, Rett syndrome. This was a paper that was published in 2009, and I added the data from our clinic to that based on what it was done there. But because when we think about it, what we also now know is that there, those pathways change the nature of the sociability, the nature of that interaction. So if you go back to my dimensional approach and we think just about sociability, what you can see is different genetic syndromes immediately prefer and provide a different approach to sociability. All these people are potentially autistic. FASD is on there as well because it's very highly sociable, but you can still have these outcomes as well if you meet enough criteria. And you can see from our most recent clinic data that most people are what we call pro-social, the green bars, um, compared to the blue bars, which is a classic type of autism. So classic aloof autism is rare in this group. But if you look at it, that pro-social nature of people's presentation, but still struggling with the core features will, will be part of it. We look at ADHD, again, a different profile of mainly inattentive symptoms, but lacking to the same extent, the hyperactivity symptoms, much lower presentation. So you have an impulsive, inattentive subtype. So again, a different type of outcome, but still overall meeting the criteria based upon them. The other area to consider is those that the chapter goes into is about how it relates to the other genetic and how you rule these different things out. And so we go into a little bit of detail about these different things and how you would try and pull them apart. Now, this is getting more medical, so I didn't want to go into this too much. But what we can see from this study is that alcohol has the strongest effects on all of the medication that was there then and causes the greatest level of deficit. But effectively, you know, the chapter goes into very much more about how to pull apart and how to try and delineate these different things. But there tend to be much more for the clinician to work through and need to read um, those aspects. So I don't, didn't want to labor that, but in terms of putting neurodevelopmental disorders into a context and where FASD fits into that world, that was the core part of that chapter. So hopefully that's answered some of your questions. And now I'm going to assure you're going to have more. That was um, quite a lot to cover in a short period of time. Thank you, as always. And I'm going to end the recording now and we'll go into Q&A because I suspect that um, there will be some questions.